So today's talk is part of our lecture series, Conversations in Forest History. Our guest today is Jason Metnick of the Sust yeah, Sustainable Forestry Initiative. And really, because Jason has so much ground to cover, I'm gonna simply turn it over to, to him. Thanks, Jason. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jamie. And thanks for allowing um, me to, to speak on, uh, on this topic. I'm just gonna um, share my slides here. Wonderful. So as Jamie said, I'm Jason Metnick. I'm Senior Vice President Customer Affairs at the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Um, I've been with SFI since 2001. And, um, and what I wanted to do today was, was really just give a, a basic overview of what ESG means when it comes to the forest sector and, um, and really understanding um, uh, who's behind these ESG um, initiatives. Um, and, and what the forest sector is, is doing to, to really get ahead and, uh, and show leadership um, on these important topics. And so e ESG, it stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And, and it's really a way that organizations are looking at how they can manage risks when it comes to these uh, three important topics. And so whether they are relevant um, material, um, environmental issues, um, social criteria, um, in, in managing relationships with employees and suppliers and customers, or governance um, within that organization and how leadership within those um, uh, companies are, are viewing and, and managing these important issues like, um, like corporate governance and board composition, executive pay, et cetera. And so when you um, hear ESG, it really come, boils down to, to risk that companies are, are looking at within their organization. So I wanted to show this, um, this graphic for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, um, the, the first is, I took this from a recent report that uh, Dovetail published um, just a couple of weeks ago. And so if you haven't taken a look at at their report, um, ESG 101, I, I would highly recommend it. But I thought that this was a good graphic to show that ESG and who cares about it is very broad in scope. And because of that, there's gonna be controversy around ESG. Now, I'm not gonna um, uh, speak about a lot of the controversies that are happening um, in the political uh, arena, but I just wanted to let you know that because this landscape is so broad and because so many people care about this issue, you're going to have um, uh, uh, critics and you're going to have controversy um, around these important topics. And so um, you can see the, the broad range of, of people who, who are looking and, and, and care about ESG, but, but that's just a, an important um, caveat as, as I move through this um, uh, presentation. Where I'm gonna focus a lot of the attention is really on two key influencers um, in, in this, um, in this uh, environment. One being the corporate um, uh, organizations and another being investors. And how I typically think about this and, and how I've, I've looked at this is um, on the corporate side, it, it's really how companies, how organizations can do good for their business. What is it that they're doing to create long-term stakeholder value within their organizations. Now, the investment side, they're kind of looking at it on a, on a different um, uh, landscape and a different lens. They're looking at it as, as a way to increase the return on investment and, and looking at, um, at these um, uh, ESG factors um, and, and what's good for, uh, for their investment um, in these companies and ensuring that there aren't long-term risks um, in their investments. And so I'm gonna look at it from both the corporate lens as well as the investor lens. So why is it booming? Well, um, there, there's a couple reasons why it's booming right now. I, I think that the big thing um, is that there are a lot of um, uh, um, factors out there um, over the last few years, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's uh, floods in the Southeast US, wildfires out in California that um, that organization businesses um, consumers the general public they are looking more closely at these um, at these issues and and understanding 
what are the risks um, in the businesses that, that I'm looking at, that I'm investing in? Um, probably the, the biggest factor and the biggest driver um, over the last few years, though, has been BlackRock. Larry Fink, uh, BlackRock manages over $10 trillion in, in assets. And, um, and in a, um, a shareholder letter that he sent out in, in 2020, um, he uh, specifically talked about the need for um, his investments and those companies that he invests in to have strong ESG performance and, and to start looking at that um, a, as a factor. And so um, it really uh, has been um, uh, uh, booming um, over the last uh, few years because of these investment uh, funds such as BlackRock. But we're also seeing a lot of public demand and, and specifically in, in the forestry space, um, you know, we, we have seen a lot of articles out there, whether it's um, shareholders looking um, at deforestation resolutions, whether it's climate change or species or biodiversity, we have seen a lot more attention. And so there, there definitely is an increase um, in awareness on a lot of risks that are associated potentially with forestry. And so because of that, you have seen a lot more increase too um, within the, the general public. So within um, the investment community, it, it really is now becoming part of investor expectations that organizations um, look at the risks within their organization when it comes to ESG. The United Nations uh, Principles for Responsible Investment, um, uh, which started in, in the mid 2000s, it was the United Nations um, basically created this as six guiding principles. And, um, and over time, um, various um, uh, signatories um, uh, agreed to, to sign on to these six guiding principles. You can see just the um, increase in the number of uh, signatories um, over the last few years within the investment community. Um, uh, this graph shows uh, 2021 data, but as of um, March 31st of 2022, there was close to 5,000 signatories uh, representing about 121 trillion US dollars. Um, so again, uh, the, this just shows that the growth in, in ESG and the influence within the investment community. We're also seeing governments, and, and this is really the only slide that I'll show within the, the government sector, but, but as this has grown um, uh, within the investment community, we're also now seeing governments, whether it's in the UK, the EU, um, the, um, the US, uh, um, through the um, uh, SEC um, proposing climate-related metrics, and, and even internationally, um, uh, more broadly as, as well, we're seeing a lot of governments starting to, to look at, at uh, reporting mechanisms and, and other um, mandatory climate-related disclosures when it comes to uh, what organizations should be reporting. And so um, the, there, there now is the government influence within um, and regulatory influence within the larger ESG landscape as well. Just like forest certification is an alphabet soup, um, so is ESG. ESG is, is an alphabet soup and, and understanding and making sense of that alphabet soup is something that I hope to uh, do in these next few slides. And so within the ESG landscape, there, there's really, I would say, um, uh, two big players when, when you're looking at the ESG landscape. The second bucket, which are the reporting standards and frameworks, and really that fourth bucket, which are the raters and, and the rankers, um, where you see certification and standards, those can be used to help um, uh, ESG performance ultimately. Um, and then in the fifth bucket here, the awards and recognitions, um, organizations do get various awards and, and, and recognitions um, based off of uh, whether they are a leader um, in the ESG space, um, and, um, and that's determined through those various organizations. But what I'm going to do is spend time on the second bucket and the fourth bucket, really, to, to show where a lot of um, the, the standards and frameworks and the raters and rankers are falling within 
this um, this ESG landscape as well. So, what are what's the ESG info that um, that investors look for from a, from a company? Well, they they want to know that that you have a strategy and exe execution and, and performance, and and looking at that long term strategic approach. What what are you doing to manage those risks? And then finally, how are you communicating um, the the data um, to show performance over time um, with uh, with those related risks? And so, what are some potential related risks um, uh, that organizations may be looking at um, uh, as it relates to the forest sector. Well, under the environmental um, uh, bucket, they, they may be biodiversity or water or climate or soil and, um, and sustainable harvest levels. Under the social, it may be um, labor rights and workforce development, indigenous people's rights and rec recognition and, and local community, urban forestry. And then under the governance, it might be management plans or, or, or different policies or procedures that uh, organizations have in place to help um, uh, uh, mitigate risks that are associated with organizations. What an organization typically does is, is they go through a, um, a materiality assessment. And, um, and these are all public on, on uh, various websites. I've, I've tried to um, show where they are found uh, within the internet, um, if anyone does want to, to, to dive deeper on some of these topics. But um, here's an example of, of a forest products company and, um, and how they are disclosing information on what they determine to be material or relevant for their organization. You can see that they've identified um, the, the issues to be most relevant they're then prioritizing those, those elements, and then they're validating um, the, the themes to, to help um, uh, address and, and establish metrics um, around how they can track uh, those, uh, those material topics over time. Um, and so here is one example. Here's another example of a uh, packaging organization within the forest sector um, where oftentimes what they'll do is, is they'll, um, they'll uh, do these materiality assessments um, in, in with external stakeholders as well as internally to see where those issues align. What, what's important for their external stakeholders and what are um, important internally to that organization. And then based off of this quadrant, then they can start to figure out what is it that we need to monitor? What is it that we need to measure? And what is it that we need to manage? from a materiality standpoint? What, what are those risks associated with our company? So again, we can show leadership in, in these topics moving forward. Investors typically receive, they collect information various ways. Um, uh, and so while the organizations are doing these materiality assessments to determine what is that risk for their organization and then how they can address those risks um, in the future, then investors are looking at, if I'm gonna invest in this company, I wanna make sure that it's a solid company and they're looking at these issues. And, and they do it uh, various ways. One is through public disclosures. One is through contacting these organizations directly. Another is, um, is, is independent research and data and, and scoring from third parties, uh, which I'll, I'll get into in a little bit through the raters and rankers. And then um, what we're seeing more often as well now is through um, artificial intelligence, data mining of websites and, and other um, information that they gather um, uh, through AI to, uh, to be able to, to determine um, investment opportunities. And so it, it is a, a, a various ways that investors are looking at how they collect this information from organizations. So within, um, uh, when I had mentioned earlier the alphabet soup of, of ESG, um, I, I talked about the standards and frameworks. And, and this really relates to um, how companies can look at what other organizations are doing and how they're defining uh, the risks related to various sectors. So for instance, SASB, which I'll, I'll speak about in, in more detail, 
um, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, they've developed about 77 different industry standards that are looking at what is material for that industry. Um, and then what organizations do is if they're part of that industry, they can utilize one of these standards to then make public disclosures on how they are aligned with a SASB standard. Um, same thing with uh, the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosures and, um, and the Global Reporting Initiative, uh, GRI, as well as uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. And so an example of this is taking the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 Sustainable Development Goals that, um, that the United Nations um, ha has developed to, to, um, to help address and, uh, and, and, and have a shared blueprint, as they uh, call it, for peace and prosperity for people on the planet. And so an organization can then look at these 17 uh, 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 UN um, Sustainable Development Goals and then figure out how they can align what they're doing with these various goals. And so under goal 13, um, climate action, there may, they may be creating carbon sequestration opportunities or investing in renewable and energy efficiency or sponsoring climate related uh, research. And so they can then talk about and communicate how they are bringing value to these specific top topics. Um, under clean water and sanitation uh, goal, they may be implementing water use efficiency practices or utilizing ground storage to capture rain and, and flood waters or, or, um, or using sustainable forestry to, um, to uh, maintain and improve water quality and quantity. And so all of these can then be aligned with what an organization is doing um, to address these various topics. SASB as well is an important standard that organizations are um, utilizing to, again, um, publicly disclose their alignment um, uh, to, these, uh, to these key material um, themes. And so I mentioned SASB has 77 industry standards. Um, there are a few that are uh, relevant for the forest products um, sector. Um, one specifically, the building products and furnishing um, uh, standard. Um, but then you also have a forestry management standard that they've developed, a, a pulp and paper product standard, and containers and packaging standard. Um, and within those um, standards that SASB develops, um, there are references to forest certification and, um, and other forest-related uh, aspects that then organizations that may be certified to a forest certification standard or maybe participating in a research project, or maybe uh, looking at, um, at biodiversity um, across their landscape in a meaningful way, they can then start to align what their organization is doing on these material themes as SASB has defined. And so SASB is an important organization because a lot of in investors and a lot of um, um, uh, other uh, organizations in this world really value those SASB standards um, as a reporting mechanism. And so again, it's, it's how organizations start aligning what their material risks are based off of their materiality assessment to these um, standards and, and frameworks, whether they be SASB um, or, um, or the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. Here's an example of some disclosures, again, publicly available on, uh, on various websites of, of one um, uh, uh, landowner or land manager as well as wood products company and how they are then communicating uh, their alignment with, uh, with some of these SASB um, standards. So here's one specifically um, looking at the building products and furnishing, uh, furnishings um, standard by SASB. And then here's another example of how an, uh, an organization is looking at it through the forest management san uh, standard that SASB has developed and looking at those topics, looking at those metrics, and then how they address those specific um, themes that SASB um, has, uh, has defined within their standard. So you have the standards and the frameworks that, that help set some of the criteria for which organizations can, can look at um, ESG alignment. 
Um, but then you also have um, raiders and rankers. And raiders and rankers um, are really um, organizations that, um, that then look at companies' performance and they rate or they rank you on if you're a leader or if you, if you are a laggard um, in this space. And here are some of the, the, the big uh, raiders and rankers in this, uh, in this field, um, MSCI, Sustainalytics, ISS, ESG, um, CDP are, are just a few of them. And so um, within the raiders and rankers, um, uh, they, they do uh, typically have their own methodology and how they score various companies. Um, I mentioned earlier that some of them um, uh, either send surveys out to organizations and collect data, some mine data um, on websites through artificial intelligence, some utilize um, uh, important standards like SASB or, um, or, or others to help influence um, some of these uh, raters, some of these rankings and, and, um, and ratings. Um, this is another one of those controversies that, um, that people point to within the ESG space, because oftentimes um, it, it is unclear where these uh, raters and the rankers get their criteria for how they score various companies. Sometimes the scoring can be very different between um, these, uh, these organizations. So maybe uh, an organization is a leader um, by one set of criteria and, and they may be a laggard by, um, by another company um, in, in the criteria they, they use. And so it, it is often difficult to, um, to, to find um, that, that, um, that, that, um, that, that value. Um, however, that said, a lot of investors do rely on these raters and the rankers to help make investment decisions. And so they are very important Within the um, within the ecosystem of ESG as well, and then you have um, other organizations. The Climate Disclosure Project (CDP) is is a good example where where they they have questionnaires that they send out, and so they have a standard. But then they're also rating you based off of um, uh, based off of the questionnaire that that you send back, and so. Um, they're kind of a, a, an organization that does both the standard and framework as well as rank you um, uh, based off of performance. And here's a, a few examples of, of certification is one of those elements that, that they look at within their criteria at uh, the Climate Disclosure Project, CDP. So moving on to... Um, there is these risks. We know that, that there's risks. And so how can you turn those into opportunities? And how can the forest sector really look at, at um, becoming a leader in this space um, instead of uh, looking at, um, at, at, the, uh, at the pitfalls potentially of, of ESG? And so I, I, I had this slide earlier in the deck where, where I talked about various factors in, in looking at, at ESG within the uh, forest sector under the environmental bucket with biodiversity and water and climate. And, and these all may, may be risks, but they're also opportunities for the forest sector to show leadership. Same under the social, same under governance. How can the forest sector really become a leader in this space by, by communicating, doing more, um, uh, talking about um, uh, how they are uh, leaders in, in this space. One is forest certification. Yes, I do represent a forest certification standard, but this applies to any forest certification out there. There are certain elements that, um, that are opportunities for the forest sector to show leadership in, um, whether it is uh, uh, um, how certification standards avoid illegal logging and deforestation or uh, the biodiversity um, metrics or looking at species at risk or sustainable harvest levels. Um, all of these can be used to demonstrate environmental performance when it comes to risk that may be associated with the forest uh, sector. Another great thing about forest certification is there is a third party audit. The financial community understands audits. They understand third party certification and so this again gives, I think, certification <clears throat> that benefit 
um, to show um, the, the value and the opportunity in mitigating risk that may have been identified um, through materi materiality assessments. Uh, just to dive a little deeper into this, um, uh, whether it's um, SFI or FSC or PEFC or tree farm, a lot of the standards have specific metrics like climate smart forestry. And within that objective, it's looking specifically at organizations need to identify and address climate change risks and then identify um, and address those opportunities to mitigate those risks. And so again, forest certification is one avenue to help um, organizations turn those risks into opportunities within the um, ESG um, um, landscape. Fire resilience and awareness as well. We know wildfire may be identified as a risk for many organizations in the forest sector. And so again, how can you uh, turn that into opportunity through various requirements and standards and, and procedures? And then again, communicating the story. We know that, um, that for the forest sector is, is doing incredible things um, in conservation leadership and, and showing that the impact that their programs are having on the ground when it comes to species, when it comes to biodiversity, when it comes to water, how can you start communicating those, those conservation impacts in a meaningful way to again, show that leadership um, uh, in turning those risks into rewards or into opportunities. Um, here are just a couple tools uh, for the forest products industry to, to utilize. Um, when it comes to um, carbon benefits um, and water benefits um, uh, in research organizations like Nikazi who have developed these incredible tools um, to show um, the, the benefits, again, associated with sustainable forestry as it relates to these important topics. Building relationships with indigenous peoples, um, why they are built into certification standards these are important topics that you see time and time again in these ESG standards. SASB has specific criteria where it talks about Indigenous peoples' rights and recognition. GRI as well has specific requirements within their um, uh, standards um, uh, that talk about Indigenous people. So again, utilizing what's out there already um, through, um, through standards and through other uh, partnerships to, again, be able to mitigate those risks and turn them into opportunities. Um, here's one example of, of a, a tool that organizations can utilize, uh, <clears throat> which are uh, online courses that were developed to help train employees within organizations on, um, on, on building meaningful relationships with indigenous communities. Um, and so if um, an organization has determined that this is an important risk in their organization through employee engagement, they could utilize tools like this to help mitigate those risks and then talk about how they have trained employees within their organization um, on these important topics. Uh, workforce uh, diversity as well as workforce um, in general is, is an important topic, I think, with this sector. How can we ensure that we're um, uh, maintaining quality workforce um, and a diverse workforce um, within the forest sector? And so, again, there are tools out there that organizations can look to um, to help in some of these meaningful conversations um, in, in workforce diversity green jobs, employment, and, and other um, important efforts. It's also important to not just look at this within the lens of what is it that my company needs to do to mitigate risk um, uh, within my organization, but it's also being looked at by customers of the forest product sector. Here's just a few big brands that I threw up on uh, put up on a on, on a slide here, but um, but they are looking at ESG within their organizations as well from a corporate lens. And so 
Here's a, a materiality matrix um, that Unilever has done, which it, again is publicly available on their website. And you can see, you know, what impacts they have on their business from the low to the high end. What's the importance by stakeholders that they have surveyed from the low end to the high end. And you can see two big ones that, that, uh, that relate within the forest product sector, deforestation and packaging. And so again, what is it that organizations within the forest sector can do to help their customers in mitigating these risks as well? Packaging being a big one in that talking about the uh, advantages of paper, talking about how um, uh, corrugated um, uh, packaging is, is preferable over, um, over plastics. Um, those, those can also be used um, with, by the forest sector to help their customers. Um, innovation is, is, is another key um, uh, uh, thing as well to help uh, the forest sector. And um, the stat, I believe, comes from the, the American Forest and Paper Association, but the paper and wood products industry has planned or announced $5 billion in manufacturing in infrastructure investments um, by 2023 to continue the best use of recycled fiber. That is, a, um, that is something that can feed into the ESG space for those organizations who are investing in this um, uh, manufacturing infrastructure to, again, help their customers um, in showing innovation in this sector as well. On the solid wood side, um, uh, mass timber, cross-laminated cross timber, um, uh, we know wood from sustainably managed forests sequesters carbon and can be a solution to a lot of these um, uh, risks that may be identified. So again, um, utilizing products in a meaningful way to help mitigate risk is another way that the forest sector can show leadership um, on these important topics. I mentioned that there are a lot of resources um, uh, on this uh, topic. And so I, I do wanna give a shout out to Dovetail Partners who I uh, mentioned earlier at the start, published a, a great publication um, uh, just a few weeks ago. Check out their website um, uh, to download that publication. And then, um, and then SFI as well has, has put out um, a lot of content um, on this topic and, and showing um, how you can turn ESG risk into opportunity through certification and other um, elements um, uh, within the, the certification space. And so with that, I, um, I will pause and uh, happy to, uh, to answer questions um, that anyone has. Thanks, Jason. Matthew Etzenhauser says, it seems like the objectives of the ESG, well, the social and governance categories have substantial overlap. Um, that is, for example, human rights and fairness. Could you describe why these are separate categories in the ESG system? Yeah, and good question, uh, Matthew. And, and this is just a, an example of, of different uh, materiality topics that, that might come into play um, on these various buckets, whether it's environmental, social, and, and government uh, governments. Um, each organization is going to do their own material materiality assessment to determine what is relevant for their organization. Um, uh, what I can tell you though, is that um, what you do see under social often are those labor and, and human rights, but then what you might see under governance are, are more of the policies um, that organizations uh, might have um, to, um, to address um, uh, some, of those, uh, some of those risks. And so they, they might have an anti-corruption or anti-bribery policy um, they, they might be looking specifically at the board governance and, and is there strong diversity with on, within their board? Um, and so there, there are different factors that, that they are looking at within the, the G sector um, uh, um, within their organization. And so there, there is um, a, a difference um, in the two, but there, there could be overlap in, in if uh, uh, the, the board has a specific policy on, on something when it comes to human rights. Okay. Hugh Canham uh, asks, should a company seek out 
a rating group or just wait for one to rate them? How does that work? <clears throat> yeah, and so um, so there there are some that that do just uh, rate and, and rank uh, w without you um, knowing about it. Um, there are others, like um, I mentioned, the Climate Disclosure Project is one where you can actually submit a, a survey and and, and complete uh, their questionnaire and and be ranked. And so it, it it really does depend on on the organization where where some are just um, doing this, uh, like I said, through um, information gathering on on corporate websites and, and other information versus um, versus being proactive as well. But I can tell you that um, that most organizations these days, um, if they are being ranked, um, their investors are letting them know of their scores, and so they are then um, uh, trying to figure out how they can score better, score higher. Um, based off of um, uh, those assessments. Okay. John Heisenbottle says, uh, it seems like the ESG folks have lost sight of the economics component of the sustainability model. And this seems like, a, well, do you have a comment on this? Um, I, I'm not sure if, if I fully agree with that. I, I, I think that, um, that, you know, many of the the investment community they are looking at this from a from an economic standpoint and ensuring the long term health um, and growth of these organizations and and if um, if uh, if uh, wildfire for instance is is determined to be a, a risk they want to know how that organization is managing that risk in a in a um, it, it, um, it, in, in a way um, to help their investment long term and so. I think it, it does help um, both sides, um, uh, the, the ESG space. Um, now, there, there could be some risks that, yeah, that, that will cost um, money to implement opportunities to help mitigate those um, concerns. But, um, but I think, um, you know, people are looking at this um, uh, through, through that long-term investment lens. Okay, so I'm going to put two... Two together here, Steve Ambrose and Samir Jamesha, and I apologize, Samir. Steve asks, what are the implications for this on third world countries? And Samir wanted to ask if you could speak a little bit about maybe uh, ESG and bamboo plantations in India or other countries. Yeah, okay. so um, I, I showed a, a graphic um, that, um, that uh, um, governments are looking at a lot of these these topics, um, uh, especially climate related risks. And uh, the European Union has been one of the big influencers within the regulatory arena just over the last year and a half, two years. And even though it's the EU that is um, setting this directive and regulation, it doesn't matter um, if you are a, a, a country or an organization that operates in a developing part of the world. Um, if you sell into the EU, that organization, that country will be required to conform with EU policy and EU regulation. And so, um, and and that that's the, the case as well for privately held companies. And so a lot of this has been driven by publicly held companies uh, where investors are investing in them, um, but it does trickle down to those privately held companies as well. If you're selling into a, a Home Depot, a Lowe's, a, a Walmart, and an Amazon, those companies are going to want to know that that they're buying solid products as well. And so um, it does trickle down um, uh, whether it is a developing country or, or even a privately held company um, into these other um, uh, avenues because of just the the growth and and um, and the boom of, of ESG within the last two years by by not just corporations and investors but also governments. Hmm. Matt Carruthers. Um says the costs of forest certification are disproportionately borne by the landowners, producers, and primary manufacturers subject to the criteria of various third-party schemes. Most say it's a cost of doing business, but there's no mathematical benefit outweighing the costs. Can we hope that ESG and financial service sectors 
will buck up for, the, or I guess maybe step up for the costs of forest certification, knowing that consumers thus far have not? Yeah, so let, and, and, um, great question. And let me take this one in, in, a, in looking at it through the lens of what can the ESG financial sector, investment sector do to um, invest in those opportunities and, and look about it and, and look at it through the lens of, of opportunities. Um, and so American Forest Foundation has developed um, some incredible um, new programs related to to climate and and um, and with the small landowner community, and you've seen some pretty big brands invest in that work. Amazon being um, one of those, and so they're not doing it because um, because they they just want PR. They're doing it to help with their own ESG uh, profile and portfolio as well, and so. Um, so they see that as as potential risks, and and they're investing in those programs um, uh, through financial um, contributions um, to help mitigate those those risks. And so I think that you will see more and more um, corporations, investors, and and others looking to the forest sector as a way to help um, mitigate and turn those risks into opportunities um, because forests offer so many great opportunities, um, especially within the environmental sector, but are the environmental bucket of, of ESG, but I would say also, also under the social um, uh, bucket of, of ESG. And so, um, yes, certification is one tool, but it's not the only tool um, when looking at at um, at ESG and and what investors uh, care about, Bill Bansif says uh, he acknowledges that you want to stay away from politics, um, but he he says based on the congressional interest in this subject, has your outfit SFI been asked to provide information to congressional members? And also, by the way, he, he softens that question with a compliment, saying, uh, absolutely outstanding presentation and well done. Yeah, so, thanks, Bill, thank, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Bill, for the question. Thanks for, um, for mixing the, the medicine with a spoonful of sugar. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and so um, when the uh, Security Exchange Commission did um, ask for comments on their new um, uh, disclosure proposal, um, that they uh, came out with um, last year, SFI did submit comments on that um, on that uh, proposal that that they're looking at. Um, we took a very broad based approach to it, and in, in, in talking about how SFI is an opportunity again to help mitigate um, climate related risks through some of the um, uh, provisions within the SFI standard. Um, and so, um, and so we did submit comments. We are following it closely. Um, and, uh, but it, again, it, it's, it's that alignment and, and what is it that our organization at SFI can do to, to help those organizations that are certified to our standard, um, in, in addressing, um, these, uh, these related risks, whether it comes from Congress, whether it comes from other government regulation like the e, uh, EU, or whether it comes from the investment community, um, it, it's all about how um, how organizations can continue to show that value um, through the programs that that we operate. Okay, Craig Patterson has a a question. He's, he's seeking a comment on this. <clears throat> so. Uh, he says, Dr. Jerry Franklin has stated that nothing is more destructive to our forests than TMOs and REITs. Those are timber investment management organizations and real estate investment uh, trusts. <clears throat> As they only relate to dollars and not ecosystems, nor rural economics or communities. Now, for a little background, for those who don't know, Jerry Franklin um, is in the, the Pacific Northwest. He's a longtime forest researcher on old growth for the U.S. Forest Service and the, I believe, the University of Washington. Uh, he was a pioneer in the, that field of study, deeply involved in the Northern Spotted Owl controversy um, as a scientist and um, is, is very much in, uh, a pioneer in the idea of ecosystem forest management. 
So that's Franklin's background. So he says that, you know, there's this focus on economics because of TMOs and REITs. Um, and, and so Craig says, I live in the center of the most productive softwood forest in the world, which is in Oregon, and there are no jobs um, in the forest sector, I assume Craig means. Um, and, he's, and so Craig is looking for your comments and observations about, I assume, TMOs and REITs and their role in ESG. Yeah, and so TMOs and REITs, um, you know, every TMO and REIT has an, an ESG report um, that they've published uh, publicly. I would strongly encourage you to, to check those out. There are 120 plus pages of, um, of information on, on how those TMOs and REITs are, are managing risks associated with their um, uh, investment uh, portfolios. And so, um, you know, I, I would I, I would I would look to those organizations. I, I don't speak, um, you know, on behalf of, of the TMOs and REITs. Many are certified to our standard, um, which means that that they are conforming to those um, objectives, performance measures, and indicators, and are certified to those requirements um, within our standard. But um, but I would strongly encourage Craig to uh, check out, um, you know, just Google any one of them. Um, uh, you know, by name, and then just just do ESG report, and um, and a lot of those will will come up. I, I'd also um, mention um, uh, that in um, in the dovetail report that I spoke about um, a bit ago, um, they also uh, have have a good uh, table in there that that lists, I, I believe, four different TMOs or, or REITs and and some of their reporting that that they've done. So definitely check out that one as well. As, re as well as, um, you know, as far as local economics and communities, yeah, I mean, that that it, that could be a risk that that many have identified, um, it, you know, to to look at. And um, and so it's what are they doing to help mitigate those risks in a meaningful way? And, and how are they publicly disclosing that? And so, um, uh, you know, I, I would look at um, at how those TMOs and REITs talk about those specific topics um uh that uh that, that you're mentioning in, in the chat okay um samir i'm going to ask you to uh restate your question it's not quite clear to me but i i would like to to ask jason um that question so if you take a minute to um yeah i'm not too familiar though with the bamboo um, oh, okay yeah, sector, and so um, it's it, I, I would struggle in, in answering that one because um, I you know I'm I'm guessing um, you know their their issues that are material to the bamboo um, sector um, may be different. They they could okay. be similar. Biodiversity, water, soil, um, you know, are probably uh, fairly similar uh, with the forest sector. Okay, um, so earlier this year we had presentations on the forest carbon market and, and all of that. How does that plug into or intersect or overlap with ESG? And before you get going, before you answer, uh, I'll just remind folks to please uh, submit your questions in the Q&A forum. Yeah, and, and I'd also just point out um, Bill Banzaf's comment um, as well in the chat to, you know, one of the benefits of forest certification uh, to offset costs is, is access to markets. And, and I think, you know, what we're seeing, the traditional markets that we saw in the past with some of those uh, big brands that I showed the slide to earlier, um, uh, it's, um, uh, I, I think um, there's this new customer that, um, that the forest sector should be looking at for additional access to additional markets, and it's this ESG community. Um, and so, um, Thank you, Bill, for, for that comment. I, I think that that's an important one. Um, so the question that, that you had is, is how ESG fits into the, the carbon markets. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, there, there are, I, I would say that that's probably the number one material theme that comes up um, with organizations and when they do the materiality assessments is, is climate and carbon. And so, um, how they uh, look at that within their organization, I think, is is important. Um, what an organization does to um, to align with uh, various um, uh, carbon uh, disclosure models, whether it's the climate disclosure um, uh, um, uh, model or or others out there, 
is is you know each organization is going to take a, a different approach but it is very important um uh, i know within just the investment community um to to look at these um uh climate related risks okay um by the way um you you there's, well, there's, I'm not seeing other questions uh, in either. Yeah, and, and to answer Lynn's question real quick, I, I actually did attend uh, the Who Will Own the Forest uh, conference um, last year. It was an incredible event and learned a great deal. And, and yeah, I mean, the, the majority of the individuals um, at that conference are, are TMOs and, and REITs. And, and so um, that, that, that is, I, I agree, an, an important e event. Um, and and it's uh, I think more important with um, with just the boom in, in ESG. So, uh, well, can you elaborate on that conference? This is the first I've heard about it. And yeah, it's hosted by the World Forestry Center. Um, it's called Who Will Own the Forest. Um, I don't know. I think there's probably 300 maybe attendees, 400 attendees oh, wow. last year. Um, you know, a uh, number of, of different topics. They had a, a great panel of, of the CEOs of some of the major TMOs and REITs um, that, that talked about a lot of um, these, um, these ESG type topics and, and themes. And so, um, yeah, I'm sure there's information on their website. But yes, to, it is in Portland, Oregon um, at the World Forestry um, Center and, um, and usually in, in September, October. Okay. Uh, Hugh Canham has asked, we are seeing forests being converted to wind and solar. I think he means farms. He says panels, but I think he means farms. Um, nevertheless, how can these companies doing that meet ESG standards? Does An interesting trade-off question. Um, <laughs> you know, these the renewable energies uh, uh, and converting forests um, to those um, to those farms. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can answer that in a very articulate way or, or not, but, um, and this gets back to John Heisenbuttle's question also, I think, um, you know, when looking at the o economics, there's always trade-offs, right? There, there's always going to be trade-offs in, in looking at these themes and these topics. And so, um, what are those trade-offs? How meaningful is it to do one thing o over the other? Um, and so those are questions I can't answer. Those are questions organizations will need to answer for themselves in, in looking at these risks um, that, that are associated with their company. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, if, um, if forests are being converted, which I, I know to be a fact, actually, we, we have um, become aware of this as of late, where forests are being converted into solar farms, um, you know, how does that then impact um, other concerns when it comes to biodiversity, deforestation, conversion, and how does that outweigh the, um, the renewable energy um, uh, uh, opportunities potentially that, that they may be looking at to um, mitigate other risks associated with uh, energy consumption? So um, all important topics and, mm -hmm. and all things that, that I can't answer today, but but they're um, they're they're great uh, great questions. I will uh, offer up an example of where a, a landowner can kind of uh, have a compromise. So the Biltmore Estate out in Western North Carolina has several thousand acres. This is you know, the the Lord, they still build themselves correctly as the the largest private home in America. And on some of their farmland, they wanted to put in solar panels, put in their own solar panel farm. Um, but they also wanted to keep it as grazing land. So they simply elevated their solar panel so that the grazing stock could move under it and continue grazing. So there, there are some ways of, there are tricks, if you will, that... Um, or think, you know, compromises. I mean, you can't grow a tree underneath a solar panel. We know that, but there are some compromises where the land can still be used for uh, different purposes or habit. You know, wildlife could move through <clears throat> uh, comfortably through a panel farm if the panels are up high enough. 
So Matthew Etzenhauser has a question that actually I'm glad he's asked. And he says, it sounds like the term materiality is referring to critical elements that inform the ESG judgments. Could, do you know where this term comes from? Um, and can you talk about that term a little bit? Um, and I, the, Matthew, it struck me the same way. It's not intuitive. So I was struggling to quite understand all of its meanings and, and maybe even nuances. Yeah, materiality or, or or what's material to a company. Um, uh, I, I believe it, it's it comes from the financial sector. Um, I could be wrong. Someone might correct me on on the chat here, but um, but it, it's basically um, what is of relevance to that organization, and so what are those relevant risks? So so just replace um, um, uh, relevant with material, and and it's the, and it's the same, and so. What, what are you looking at within your organization that is relevant to your organization? Um, and so it's just a, a term that is being used um, within the investment community um, and, and those materiality assessments, those, those assessments um, uh, to look at, at relevant uh, risks within those organizations. Okay. Rick Kim Charles says, or asks, what impacts will ESG and requirements and certification standards like SFI have on a small family forest owner? Let's let's pull a, a figure of like five thousand acres. Yeah, I and so great question, Rick. You, you might have stumped me on 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 this one, um, uh, but I I think it it's an important one because. There was a question earlier on on how that trickles down um, to to the investment community, or from the investors um, all the way down to um, to those landowners, and and I would categorize this in in that same conversation. Um, and so, you know, I I think um, ultimately, if organizations, if the um, uh, investment community um, wants to invest in in some of those risks um, that that they may be concerned about there could be an opportunity um, for um, small family forest owner engagement um, you know I think also um, understanding um, uh, and so specific to SFI it, it may play into how our standard like the fiber sourcing standard, looks at certain topics and, and issues when it comes to biodiversity and, and water um, and community outreach. And so what are then those manufacturers who may be purchasing from these small landowners, what are they doing to look at biodiversity over a landscape? What are they doing to look at water so that they can communicate that um, uh, upstream to, uh, to their um, uh, customers? And so specific to SFI, it may show up in the fiber sourcing standard um, and, and how they're looking at it. Okay. Well, Jason, thank you very much for today's presentation and, and the Q&As.